the world crisis. When President Xi left Moscow this month, he said, we should push forward these changes that have not happened for a hundred years. Take care. What are the symptoms of this crisis? Well, there's the war in Iran, in Ukraine. There's the threat of war over Taiwan. There's a banking crisis. There's inflation. But all of these are symptoms of a long-term process. The process is the critical decline of Western hegemony. And China's recovery from its 19th century humiliation and the rise of Indian capitalism. Alongside this has gone the deindustrialization of major Western powers. So I'm going to look at the long term historical process that is culminating in what's happening now. <coughs> Western dominance has gone through multiple phases. The first phase is what one could call Iberian feudal imperialism in the 16th and 17th century when the Portuguese and Spanish empires rose to dominance. In the 18th century, there was a period of struggle between Dutch, French and British mercantile capital to see who would replace Spanish dominance. From 1815 to 1921, you had the dominance of British industrial capitalism and the British Empire, terminating in 1921 when Britain formally ceded naval mastery over the USA. From 1898 to 1948, you had a period of intense inter-imperial rivalry, wars and revolutions, similar to the 18th century. From 1948 to 1991, you had the Socialist Challenge, the death of European imperialism and the victory of the National Liberation Movements. From 1991 to 2021, roughly, we had US hegemony and the attempted return to imperialism. From last year, we entered the crisis of Western hegemony. Now let's look at <coughs> the first period, the period of Habsburg's dominance. So a long time ago, but there are aspects of this which are still very relevant. During this period, the Spanish and Portuguese empires were immensely rich and their wealth came from the bullion they were able to extract from their American colonies, mainly South American colonies. With this bullion, they could pay from manufacturers from the lowlands, England and China. In consequence, Iberian manufacturers stagnated since it was easier to import from other nations. That was fine in the short term, but in the long term, Spain and Portugal fell behind England and Holland economically, and the Dutch and English began to develop countless manufacturing and in turn rose to dominance. Now, in the period of British hegemony, what you had were tribute and taxes coming in from India or South Asia mainly from South Asia. This was only possible because Britain had succeeded in its 18th century wars, a series of wars from 1745 to 1815, by which it was able to gain control of India and Canada and make them part of the British rather than the French Empire. With the tribute that it got from the empire, it was able to fund capital exports. And these capital exports went primarily to the temperate zones of European settlement. Only a small share went back to South Asia. In the main, they went to North America, southern cone of um, 
South America and Australasia. The consequence was that Canada, the USA, Argentina and Australia underwent rapid capitalist development. You had well-fed populations which grew rapidly. South Asia, under heavy British taxation, remained largely backward, an agricultural economy with stagnant or declining living standards and frequent disastrous famines. Meanwhile, continental Europe and Japan developed internally funded capitalist economies. So we see again what we saw with the Habsburgs. British capital exports had created the great US industrial power that was destined to replace British imperialism. In 1900, we therefore had a whole multiplicity of centres of industrial capitalism competing for the resources of the rest of the world which was non-industrial. The great world powers were in terms of industrial output the USA, the German Empire, the British Empire, French, Japanese and Russian empires. In terms of population the first was the British Empire. It's rather surprising we're used to the largest state in the world being India, uh, being China, but of course South Asia was part of the British Empire, so that made it the largest of the great powers in terms of population. Following it was the Chinese Empire, but the Chinese Empire had relatively little industry and was therefore much weaker than its population would indicate. Then came the USA, the Russian Empire and German Empire. This world had a whole set of contradictions. There was an Anglo-Russian contradiction over India. Britain, the British and Russian empires were advancing from India and towards India and clashed over Afghanistan and the major part of British defence strategy or British Imperial Defence Strategy, the Committee for Imperial Defence was dominated by the Government of India, obviously the colonial government of India, and the need to defend India against Russia was the dominant concern. At the same time, there was a Russo-Japanese contradiction over who was to be able to exploit China. British and Japanese empires then allied to block Russia. The British armed Japan and the Japanese defeated Russia in 1905 and blocked Russian expansion into China. There was a contradiction between the USA and the Spanish and German empires over Cuba, Philippines, Venezuela. The US seized the Philippines in 1898 and in the process almost came into conflict with the German Navy with, that also sailed into the Manila Harbour in attempt to seize it. It is often forgotten now but in 1900 the German Imperial General Staff had detailed plans for landings on the east coast of the United States the seizure of the major industrial towns in the United States to force the United States to withdraw from the Monroe Doctrine and allow German imperialism to take over large areas of Latin America. So the world was entering a period of crisis. President Xi said, a period of change we haven't seen for a hundred years. Well, what you had was a half century of wars to divide the world. A half century which resulted in the triumph of the USA over all its rivals. If you look at 1949, the industrial developed capitalist regions hadn't changed since 1900. No other capitalist country had been able to make the transition from agriculture to industry. The Japanese, Turkish, 
German, Spanish, Austrian and Russian empires had been defeated. The British and French empires were bankrupt and heavily in debt to the US. By 1962, British and French imperialism were essentially also defeated. And the US had become the unrivaled capitalist hegemon. Now, why did the US win? Well, obviously, it had clear advantages. It was the largest capitalist power in terms of industrial population. It had ample resources of energy, minerals and food. It had a high capital to labour ratio, which meant it had greater per capita productivity. It had high wage rates, which provided a feedback mechanism because it encouraged automation and mechanisation. Encouraged it more than in Europe or Japan. So it was able to, by the 1940s, to massively outproduce and out-export the rest of the world. But the half century of inter-imperial wars resulted in a revolutionary wave. Russia, China, North Korea, Eastern Europe were removed from the world capitalist order. And these states posed potential rivals to US dominance. So the US organizes NATO and a series of other alliances to bring the entire capitalist world under its financial and military control. Its aim was to contain and wear down the USSR. At the same time, it tried to suppress national liberation movements allied to the USSR in Asia and Africa. In the end, it failed to suppress these national liberation movements. It was defeated in Vietnam and the, the movements in the Portuguese colonies and in French colonies succeeded and uh, the national liberation mo movements won with often with Russian or Chinese arms. So the let's look at how the economy changed. After 1945 the US as I said was the dominant industrial power and it ran a big trade surplus. The dollar was established as the international reserve currency and the dollar was in demand to purchase industrial products that only the US at that point could supply. And these dollars were provided by loans from US banks or by direct capital investment by US firms. In the process, US multinationals acquired major positions in Europe. Now this was capital expert in a real sense. It was a real flow of US produced surplus value out of the USA in to other countries. But it was a net outflow of actual capital equipment. And this accelerated economic development elsewhere, even though it gave US finance and monopoly capital a dominant role in these economies. Obviously, Europe, Taiwan, South Korea as examples. But all this changed from the late 60s. The cost of the Vietnam War, along with the rise of exports from the new revitalized European industry of cars, etc., to the US, reversed the trade balance. The US was now running a trade deficit. And unlike Britain a century earlier, it couldn't just tax India to cover this deficit. Instead, it paid for it with seigneurage. What is that? It's the form of state revenue that comes from minting money with a face value that exceeds its gold or silver value. Up until 1971, the US wasn't doing that because the US dollar, although it wasn't made of gold, could be converted into gold at a rate of $35 to the ounce. The US had undertaken at the Bretton Woods Conference to maintain this convertibility. But by 1971, because of these rise in imports and the rise in military expenditure, it had issued dollars that exceeded the government's gold reserves. And faced with French demands that the Bank of France's holdings of dollars be redeemed in gold, 
the US suspended convertibility. What this mean? French firms had exported cars and other consumer goods to the US, and that was a real transfer of value to the US. But the US was refusing to transfer an equivalent amount of co commodities, whether other exports such as planes or planes plus gold to France in return. And therefore this wasn't really commodity exchange, because commodity exchange requires circuit CMC, and this is requires an exchange in, of equivalents in terms of value, where you start off with value in commodity A and get the equivalent value of commodity B back. Instead it was a one-way process, going from commodities to dollars. Formally it still looked like an exchange of equivalents. Cars came from France to America. Dollars went back. And since the dollar was the world money, this was the universal equivalent and therefore appeared to be equivalent exchange, but it only worked so long as the Bank of France was willing to issue the Citroën company with francs in return for dollars. And the crisis arose when the Bank of France said it was only willing to do this in exchange for actual gold. Nixon dropped the convertibility and this immediately faced Europe and Japan with a problem. Since the dollar was the international reserve currency, if the franc was no longer convertible against dollars, French international trade would become impossible. So France just had to accept the American diktat. Now this gave the US Treasury historically unprecedented power. The British Exchequer had funded itself by explicitly taxing its possessions in Asia and Africa. Through dollar seigneurage, the USA after 1971 acquired a power to extract tribute from the entire world economy. With this tribute, it could finance what was an almost unlimited level of military expenditure. So that its military expenditure exceeded that of the next five countries put together. At its best, Britain had been able to exceed the next two countries. Under Reagan, it used this money to deliberately ramp up an arms race and bankrupt the USSR. When the Soviet Union collapsed, this established a unipolar world where you had complete financial and military domination by the United States, what the US conservatives hoped would be the American century. Well, they got 30 years. But it was a banker's paradise was at last. By means of a credit multiplier, the Wall Street banks acquired even greater purchasing power than the US Treasury Department. With the dollar being the universal currency and the US running a trade deficit, all the firms that exported to the US built up credit balances in the Wall Street banks. And the Wall Street banks could then lend this at interest to the rest of the world. If a country ran into difficulties paying its debts, the US controlled International Monetary Fund and World Bank imposed what were called structural adjustment programs. And what these did was privatize public resources and transfer them to the control of US capital in lieu of repayment of the debts. Essentially, Wall Street acquired via dollar hegemony the means to steal the world's capital assets, whilst the US Treasury imposed tax revenues on the rest of the world. If you want to understand what is called the financialization of the US economy, and the rise of the fire finance insurance real estate sector relative to the industrial sector. It all stems from this. But in the process the US is repeating the fate of the Habsburgs. We're getting the same economic model. The US exported dollars to the Middle East 
and got back real value in the form of oil. It exported dollars to Asia and got back real value in the form of manufactures. Great whilst it lasted. But with the vast free dollar purchasing power now available, it became cheaper for the US to import than to meet its own manufacturing needs. So US industry declined relative to that East and Southern Asia. And the financial position of the Middle East was boosted. Same process that sank the Habsburgs, except now it is Asia rather than the lowlands and England that become the centers of manufacturing. Now, why did the world put up with this? Well, it comes from a deep contradiction of capitalism. Capitalism is based on the circuit MCM prime, where you go from money to commodities to more money. And this requires a constantly growing stock of money. And the US trade deficit, paid for by printing dollars, provided this money supply. Foreign capitalists could provide an ever-growing dollar bank balance. So they appeared to be achieving MCM prime. And this is what Adam Smith criticised as the mercantilist delusion. Mistaking money for wealth. But it's a delusion that's built into the logic of capitalism. Now, saying the US faced the Habsburg contradiction, but it also faced the Hohenzollern dilemma. Another monarchy, the Hohenzollerns, dominated Europe in much the same way as US dominated the world after 1971. After the Hohenzollerns defeated France, they were the dominant military power in Europe. By 1912, this position was threatened. His, emperors, his generals told the emperor that his last chance, should he so wish, to defeat Russia and France would be gone by 1916, by which point Russian military potential and Russian industry would have outproduced that of Germany or would out, that, along with France, would outproduce Germany. This was being financed by French capital. So he then took decisions which sealed his empire's fate. If you want to read about this, I can recommend um, Fisher's books on German war aims in the First World War. 110 years later, the USA is facing the same dilemma. Instead of France and Russia, it's facing Russia and China. The difference is that China has already overtaken it in industrial output and is far out producing it in ships. Back in 1914, the Emperor's strategy had been to quickly knock out his weaker rival, that was France, before turning on Russia. Well, Biden is repeating the same strategy. His aim has been to knock out Russia by sanctions and military aid to Ukraine before turning to attack China. We have to ask, will this seal his fate in the same way it sealed the fate of the Hohenzollern Empire? It's not a brief crisis. The old apocalyptic saying that we're hearing of wars and rumours of wars, nations rising against nation, kingdoms against kingdoms, famines and earthquakes. All that. The overall throw of five centuries of Western domination is going to come at the cost of great trauma. It's not going to be easy. Old alliances will break. Finances will shatter. States will descend into stasis and revolution. We can see this happening rapidly. The US is openly planning more with China. Within the last two months, it has stated it will transfer nuclear subs to Australia, develop bomber bases in Northern Australia. Within the last year, it has been realised that the US and EU lack the industrial capacity to replace Ukrainian military losses, and that's even before 
Chinese industry steps in as a Russian supplier. In the meantime, China has broken a peace agreement between Saudi and Iran, and this is tending to exclude the US from the Gulf, which has been a dominant target for the US since the Carter administration. This means that increasing amounts of oil trade are occurring in non-dollar currencies. The Saudis and Iranians are applying to join the SCO and BRICS. This is resulting in de-dollarization, which is pressurizing the Federal Reserve to raise interest rates. This raising of interest rates threatens the stability of US banks, or Swiss banks for that matter. Both cases, the sanctions taken against Russia, the seizure of Russian financial assets has encouraged the wealthy in other countries to withdraw their money from Switzerland or the US. The US is therefore faced with the dilemma either it raises interest rates and the banks fall or it prints more money to support the banks and in the process devalues the dollar and accelerates inflation. Internally, this is resulting in sharp conflicts between the two wings of the American ruling class, the Republicans and the Democrats, and you get increasing discussion in the USA that they're headed for a second civil war. And you can see open social discontent in France and Israel. Now, if you live in the NATO countries, or if you live in Australia, you should be opposing the war preparations that are being led by the US. The objective of these war preparations is to maintain what is now an obsolete system of Western world domination. This is something which is objectively reactionary in the sense that it is an attempt to return to an economic order that is irretrievably lost. Western world domination was a temporary historical phenomena brought about by a monopoly of industrial technique. In its present form, it is not even industrial. The industrial monopoly having been broken, all that's left is a parasitic financial oligarchy. And the economic policies of this oligarchy have, for nigh on 50 years, been holding any ad down any advance in the conditions of labour. And in the defeat of this oligarchy, whether internally or by outside powers, lies the best hope of progress for all of those who are exploited by it. I'll finish with something Mao said in 1936, as the danger of war looms. War, this monster of mutual slaughter among men, will finally be eliminated by the progress of human society and the not too distant future too. When human society advances to the point where classes and states are eliminated, there will be no more wars, counter-revolutionary or revolutionary, unjust or just, that will be the era of perpetual peace.